This lecture will be about manifolds with boundary. Towards the end of this lecture, we will state Stokes' theorem, which is the culmination of this course. Since this is such an important lecture, I thought I will do it in this new homemade studio that I have set up here. Hopefully, you will like this new setup for doing video lectures online. So, the notion of manifold with boundary seeks to capture those sets which look like a manifold plus they have a boundary component which also looks like a manifold. So, examples of this include the closed disk. Just take the usual disk along with its boundary circle. So, closed disks are the prototype for manifolds with boundary. The another example is a closed ball. We have already seen that open balls are manifolds, spheres are manifolds. When you put them together, you get what is known as a manifold with boundary. The third prototype example is a cylinder including its two boundary circles. There are these two boundary circles. A cylinder is an object of the type S1 cross 0, 1. Let's see how we can capture this notion of a manifold with boundary using the technology we have developed so far. And the definition is straightforward. If you just take the local parametrization definition in that is definition 3 in the definition of a manifold except now you allow that open set to be not just an open set in Rn but an open set in the lower half plane. What do I mean by that? Well, I am going to define this object for you which is Rn minus this is by definition just those points x1, x2, dot, 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 xn in Rn, in Rn such that x1 is less than or equal to 0. I am considering the lower portion of Rn essentially. Now, this set has a obvious boundary in the topological sense. This boundary is nothing but the set. 0, comma, x2, comma, dot, 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 xn in Rn. That is the first coordinate is 0. That is the boundary of this set. Okay. Now, we are going to define what it means for a function to be CK smooth even when not defined on an open set. And the definition is as follows. Definition, let A subset of Rn be any set, any set f from a to rk is said to be, is said to be cp smooth, cp smooth, cp smooth if we can find, find an open set, an open set u subset of Rn and this U must contain A and a CP smooth map, CP smooth map G from U to Rk such that G restricted to A is equal to F. So, essentially what the definition says is you take this set and this map F you can, if you can find a larger open set U that contains this A and F extends to that set as a CK smooth mapping, then F is a CK smooth mapping. So, the definition is what you would think of if this definition was not given to you. This is the most natural and straightforward way to define what CK smoothness on a non-open set is going to be. Okay. Now, once we have made this definition, then the definition of a manifold with boundary is exactly the same. The definition of a manifold, manifold with boundary, with boundary is definition 3 in, not definition 3, the third definition of manifold is the third, third definition of manifold that is via local parametrizations of manifolds with with u now and open set open set in 
in R n minus. Okay. Now note that if you have a subset U of R n minus that is open as a subset of R n, then at those points the set, the image of the parameterization is going to look exactly like the usual manifold. That is, this is sort of like a remark I want to make. Remark if u subset of R n minus is open as a subset of R n, as a subset of R n, then, then if you have this parameterization phi from u to m, then phi of u, phi of u is exactly like a usual manifold, exactly like a usual manifold, usual manifold. Okay, so what happens is some pieces of this manifold with boundary uh, is going to look exactly like the usual notion of manifold that we have seen, but some regions are going to be special. More precisely, if you look at those pictures, these points, they all look the same. They all look like how a, mani how a regular manifold that we have studied looks like. Whereas these points are somewhat special. They are the images of points coming from the boundary of U. How is boundary of U defined? Well, if, if U subset of R and minus, then boundary of u boundary of u is by definition is by definition the topological boundary which i'm just going to call uh, del t the usual topological boundary that you are familiar with but intersected with uh, r uh, just one moment intersected with boundary of r n minus okay the topological boundary and the boundary of R n minus one, uh, R n minus in this new sense are obviously the same. That's just going to be one of the planes, the x1 equal to zero plane. You look at those points in the topological boundary of U, which intersect this plane and that is called the boundary of U, okay? Now, we define if M is a manifold with boundary, is a manifold with boundary then then we define we define boundary of m by definition to be those p in m such that for some some local parameterization for some local parameterization p is in the P is in the image of the boundary of u. Okay, so for some local parameterization phi from u to m. So you collect together those points of the manifold with boundary, which are the images of boundary points under phi, put them together in a set, and that is called the boundary of m. Now there are certain exercises in these nodes which sort of tell you that this is actually well defined. You, if you choose, it is not possible for a boundary point of a manifold to be in the image of another local parameterization where that point comes from a interior point of U, which is also an interior point when considered as a subset of Rn. That cannot happen. So in pictures, suppose you have, let's take the standard example of a cylinder, Let's take the standard example of a cylinder. Let's say you parameterize this cylinder by some, some piece here. Somehow you transform this to this piece. Somehow you transform this piece to this piece here. Then it cannot happen that there is another, another local parameterization where this interior point goes to this point in the boundary circle. That cannot happen. Uh, uh, there is an exercise to that effect in the notes. Okay, so we have now defined the basic idea of manifold with boundary. I have given you several examples, but intentionally I have not checked any of them. So have fun checking that the closed disc, the closed balls and these cylinders are all manifolds with boundary. Now, the next object of interest is what is the tangent space of a manifold with boundary? 
Okay, but before we get to that, let me make some notational remarks. Now, when I say M is a manifold, M is a manifold, then it is trivially a manifold with boundary, with boundary empty, right? So, whenever I can treat any manifold itself as a manifold with boundary without any issues, but I will not do that uh, in the sense that whenever I say M is a manifold, I always mean, I always mean in the usual old sense, in the old sense, that is no boundary. If I want to say manifold with boundary, if I say manifold with boundary, then boundary of M is not zero, is not empty, of course, not, is not empty. You can treat any manifold M in the old sense as a manifold with boundary, with boundary empty. But that's a bit silly. So, whenever I say manifold with boundary, it is implicitly understood that the boundary of the manifold is non-empty. So, one more exercise is, in this case, this boundary of M is going to be an N minus 1 dimensional manifold. That is, the boundary of an N dimensional manifold with boundary is going to be an N minus 1 dimensional manifold without boundary, okay? That's why I said just manifold. When I say just manifold, that means there is no boundary. So, keep that in mind in the future. So, I want you to check all this. I'm leaving a lot for you because I'm really pressed for time. Okay, now let's move on further and define the pivotal notion of tangent space. If you take a point P on this manifold with boundary, and if that point happens to be in the image of a local parameterization, where that point comes from an interior point considered as Rn, where Rn as the ambient space, that is in the picture I have drawn a point, let's say here, here, somewhere on the surface of the cylinder far away from the boundary circles, then you can just define the tangent space in the usual way. Just look at the parametrization, take the derivative and push forward the whole vector space Rn. That image is called the tangent space. The same definition holds true for manifolds with boundary. Okay, tangent spaces, tangent spaces, tangent spaces for manifolds with boundary, manifolds with boundary are defined in the same way as before, defined in the same way as before, okay. So, there is a subtlety here, if you look at this special boundary point uh, here, if you look at this special boundary point, the tangent space here is also going to be two dimensional, the way we have defined. Now, let us look at this definition a bit more carefully, suppose you have phi from u to m and a is in the boundary of u, then by definition the tangent space at phi a of m is by definition d phi a the image of this. Now the question arises what the hell is d phi a? Note that a is a boundary point of u and phi is defined only on u. So, I do not know how to take derivative of phi at A, but because I define smoothness, CK smoothness for a set which is not necessarily open by saying there is a larger open set on which phi extends as a CK smooth mapping, this is not an issue at all. So, in the cylinder case, what will happen is this map phi, this map phi that we have will actually extend to some portion below also not exactly so symmetrically and so nicely, but it will extend below also to get a CK smooth mapping. So, you can take the derivative at such a point. You can take the derivative of such a point, you just choose some extension and take the derivative there. But wait a second, what if there are two extensions of phi, but their derivative maps are totally different? Well, that cannot happen and that is an exercise for you to check. So, this tangent space to a manifold with boundary is also well defined and it is also n dimensional even though the boundary of the manifold is an n minus 1 dimensional manifold. This will be key in the next definition that of the canonical orientation to the boundary. So, this is the notion of canonical 
orientation orientation on boundary of m so suppose suppose m is a manifold with boundary let's say manifold with boundary we already i mean i have already made the remark that in this event the boundary of m is non empty i am not going to give set up a stupid terminology where a manifold is also a manifold with boundary but that is commonly used you should be familiar with that terminology also so m is a manifold with boundary so the boundary of m is n minus 1 dimensional manifold as as you would have checked by now in the exercises okay and this n minus 1 dimensional manifold does not have a boundary suppose m is orientable suppose m is orientable what does this mean this means that you can choose an orientation for each tangent space note all tangent spaces are all n dimensional because of the way we have defined the tangent space even at those boundary points of m so all the tangent spaces are n dimensional vector spaces you can choose an orientation for each vector space and this should be compatible which means you must be able to find an orientation cover such that all these orientations cover take the standard basis to a set basis of the tangent space which is equivalent to the given orientation okay so you can orient all tangent spaces so that's what m is orientable means and this same definition holds even if m has a boundary because the tangent spaces are all at the end of the day n dimensional vector spaces so take an orientable manifold then then boundary of m is also orientable how do you choose this orientation of the boundary well take an orientation cover phi i from ui to m this means that the images of ui cover m and d phi i at all points take the standard basis in its standard order to a basis of tpm which is equivalent to the to the assigned orientation so you can assign an orientation for each tangent space that, that is compatible in this manner so take an orientation cover take an orientation cover okay now what you do is the following if you look at this picture of a cylinder if you look at this picture of a cylinder there is one additional vector which is going to be in the tangent space even at the boundary right so here here there will be two vectors even though you have a circle as the manifold the boundary of the manifold is just a circle so you you the uh, the um tangent space of circle is just one going to be one vector which is going to look something like this okay but there will be an additional vector right so what you do is the following what you do is the following let let a b in the boundary of ui so take a point in the boundary and look at p equal to phi of a p equal to phi of a now observe that d phi at a of e1 d phi at a of e1 is there in tpm by definition this is just the image of the unit vector e1 the standard basis vector e1 under the map d phi this is going to be there in the tangent space tpm by definition of the tangent space even for manifolds with boundary okay now such a vector this vector d phi a of e1 call it v1 this is called an outward normal this is called an outward normal okay now the reason why this is going to be called an outward normal will become clear to you if you take a smooth manifolds course in the future but since i am pressed for time i am not going to elaborate any more um this is going to be an outward normal the orient orient tp boundary of m by v2 to vn v2 to vn such that v1 v2 dot 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 vn is equivalent is equivalent to to d phi at a e1 comma dot 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 d phi at a en so what this is saying is you have to choose an orientation for the vector space tp of boundary of m the claim is that the boundary has a canonical induced orientation coming from the orientation of m 
the boundary of the manifold TP dm is going to have one vector less in a basis. It's an n minus one dimensional object. I'm going to tell you that the orientation of TP dm is given by this vector v2 to vn, where v2 to vn satisfy the property that if you adjoin v1 to it and get a basis and get a basis for TPm, then v1, v2, vn is equivalent to the induced orientation coming from the orientation cover. Okay. So you have essentially you have dedicated or fixed the orientation by choosing an outward normal and once having chosen that outward normal you orient the boundary in such a way that the net orientation you get of the manifold m is same as the one coming from the orientation cover or in other words is compatible with the orientation coming from the orientation cover. Now I am not going to elaborate on this further there, is a, there are some subtleties what if the outward normal is going to look entirely different if you choose a different uh, map phi coming from the orientation covers and all that, all that will not happen. This will actually give you a well-defined orientation on the boundary of M. I am going to skip the proofs for the time being. But one thing you should know that if you take the, the all this will agree with the intuition that you have seen in vector analysis. If you have let us say a closed disk, then the orientation of the boundary of the closed disk is anti-clockwise. That otherwise, what, I mean, in other words, what this is saying is when you orient the tangent spaces of the circle, the orientation should be this way, should be this way. That is essentially what anti-clockwise is trying to tell you, okay. So, this will agree with the notion of orientation you have learnt in vector, vector analysis, even for three dimension with the left hand or right hand, you do some spares, I mean, gestures to find out. Uh, which direction is the outward normal and so on. It will agree with all that, but I am going to postpone a detailed discussion for the time being. Okay. So, at last we are at the culmination of this course, I am going to state Stokes' theorem. I am going to defer the proof of Stokes' theorem. We will take a detailed look at its applications and Green's theorem before I give uh, the actual proof of the Stokes' theorem, which has a bit of technicalities. So, the, here is the statement of Stokes' theorem. Here is a statement of Stokes' theorem. Let M be a n dimensional n dimensional manifold manifold oriented manifold oriented manifold with boundary. Okay, that means the boundary is non empty. Give the boundary of M the induced orientation. This is the orientation which we were talking about all this while, the induced orientation. Okay. Let omega, omega be a compactly supported, compactly supported n minus 1 form, n minus 1 form on the boundary of M. What compactly supported means is just this. You look at the set of all points where this form is not identically 0, take the closure. That should be a compact set in boundary of M. That is what this means. So, this just means that support of phi, uh, support of, or rather, let me just expand out the definition. This just means x in uh, boundary of M such that omega x is not identically 0, the closure of this set is compact. That is what this means. Now, uh, the final conclusion of Stokes' theorem is then when you integrate, when you integrate a function f, uh, sorry, not the function f, when you integrate this form omega on the boundary of m, this is same as integrating over m of the derivative, the exterior derivative. I should not write do, I should write d. Okay d of omega. So, this just says that the boundary here sort of becomes a d inside. This is, uh, I mean, if you have been carefully paying attention to my lectures, you would have noticed that I made some remark like this, that this d operator can be treated as a boundary. That is essentially what is happening here. The boundary here has been somehow shifted off to the form, into the in the form of exterior derivative. There is an entire study 
of this operator D, it's called DRAM cohomology, which you will learn if you ever take a course on algebraic topology. So here is the queen theorem of this course. I managed to do it in one slide. So this whole theorem is a generalization of various theorems in vector analysis that you have seen. In the application section and in the assignment, final assignment, I am going to give you uh, several exercises which will apply Stokes' theorem and use it to prove various classical theorems and identities in vector analysis. I will defer a proof of Stokes' theorem. Uh, this is this uh, proof will not be a part of your exam. But I will, uh, during the summer, I will upload lectures where I prove Stokes' theorem. Before that, I will prove Green's theorem. And I'll also take a slightly more detailed look at orientation and manifolds with boundary, which I have covered quite quickly so that I can get to Stokes' theorem. This is a course on real analysis and you have just watched the video on manifolds with boundary and Stokes' theorem.